Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today we begin winding up our deep dive into the year 1973 with a look at the fourth quarter of the year, the months of October, November, and December. And as we've done in prior quarters, we'll take it in two parts. This time we'll talk mostly about music in that quarter. Next time we'll talk about movies, television, the news, and what our old friends the Beach Boys were up to. And the last quarter of 1973 was a huge quarter for music releases and new music. Incredibly, incredibly prolific. Just to give you an idea, check this out. These are just the albums that went top 15 from that quarter, and just the ones that I happen to have my own copies of. As you can see, there is plenty to get to, so let's get started right away with a look at the top 10 albums on that first chart of the quarter, October 7th, 1973. Winding up its five-week run at number one was the Allman Brothers Band's Brothers and Sisters album. Stoner humor was a huge thing in 1973, as evidenced by the fact that Cheech and Chong's Los Cochinos album was at number two. At number three was Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On album. This will go to number two on October 20th. Grand Funk's We're an American Band had spent the last two weeks at number two. It was now at number four. Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions was at number five. It had peaked at number four on September 22nd. War's Deliver the Word album was at its number six peak. At number seven was Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly album. This had been at number three for the prior two weeks. At number eight was Helen Reddy's Long Hard Climb. That'll be its chart peak. Just entering the top ten at number nine was the Rolling Stones' Goat's Head Soup. This will jump to number one next week and stay there for four weeks. And the only album still in the top ten from the beginning of the prior quarter was Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. This had, in fact, now been in the top ten for six months. Turning to top ten singles on that first chart, October 7, 1973, at number one was Half Breed by Cher. In the first of two weeks at the number one position, its success was helped in part, no doubt, by her weekly appearances on the very popular Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour. Paul Simon's Loves Me Like a Rock was at its peak of number two. At number three was possibly the greatest makeout song of all time, Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye. It had gone to number one on September 8th and again on September 22nd. Where an American Band by Grand Funk was at number four, it had been number one a week earlier on September 29th. Stevie Wonder's Higher Ground was at number five. It will go to number four on October 13th. Who's that lady? Who is that lady? Part one by the Isley Brothers was at its number six peak. Ramblin' Man by the Allman Brothers Band was at number seven. It'll reach number two on October 20th. I am Jay. ING. A great single by the Rolling Stones was at number eight. It'll reach number one on October 20th. Delta Dawn by Helen Reddy was at number nine. It had been number one on September 15th. And at number 10 was Keep On Truckin' Part One by Eddie Kendricks. A great single that will go to number one for two weeks beginning November 10th. Top 10 singles that will come and go in the fourth quarter included Midnight Train to Georgia by Gladys Knight and the Pips. It'll be number one for two weeks beginning October 27th. Paper Roses by Marie Osmond will go to number five for two weeks beginning November 3rd. Art Garfunkel's All I Know will hit number nine on November 10th. New teen bubblegum act The DeFranco Family featuring Tony DeFranco as the prospective new Donny Osmond will have a hit with Heartbeat, It's a Love Beat, which will go to number three on November 17th. It's the first and will be by far the biggest of their three top 40 hits. The lead single for Jim Croce's new album, I Got a Name, had been released on the day after his death in a plane crash in September. It'll reach number 10 on November 17th. I noticed that the 45 said it was from the film The Last American Hero. The Last American Hero is an obscure film starring Jeff Bridges as a moonshine runner who wants to become a NASCAR champion. Ringo Starr's Photograph will go to number one on November 24th. 
Billy Preston's instrumental single, Space Race, will go to number four for two weeks beginning November 24th. Chicago's Just You and Me will hit number four for two weeks beginning December 8th. And The Love I Lost, part one by Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, will go to number seven on December 8th. And If You're Ready, Come Go With Me by the Staple Singers will go to number nine on December 22nd. And kicking off those big fourth quarter album releases, on October 5th came Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Elton John had created a mightily impressive body of work over the last three years, and now, just over eight months since his last album, he was already following up with a lavish double album. This was arguably his best so far, full of great songs in a wide variety of styles. It was the epitome of the big, glittery, show-busy early 70s music that defined the era, and it will be a massive success. Released on October 9th was Imagination by Gladys Knight and the Pips. On October 19th came Neil Diamond's soundtrack to the film Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Also released on October 19th, some called him the Space Cowboy, some called him the Gangster of Love, but Steve Miller was the Joker on his new hit album. And on that same day came a big double studio album from The Who, Quadrophenia, another rock opera, this one with a gatefold sleeve and a lavish big booklet of black and white photos illustrating the story. The booklet and the lyrics for Quadrophenia confounded a lot of American teenagers who didn't know what a lorry was, let alone anything about mods and rockers in the UK in the mid-60s. Nevertheless, it was full of incisive lyrics and powerful tracks. It will be a major success, and most U.S. teenagers will eventually figure it out. The Who's North American tour in support of the album will get off to a rocky start on November 20th at San Francisco's Cow Palace when drummer Keith Moon collapses on stage twice. The band recruit 19-year-old audience member Scott Halpin to stand in on drums and complete the show. On December 2nd, the entire band and their entourage will be jailed briefly in Montreal in relation to $5,995.34 in hotel damages. Reportedly, some of the band members are more culpable than others. The North American tour will end on December 6th after 12 dates. Getting back to album releases, on October 26th, Headhunters by Herbie Hancock is released. It'll hit the top 40 in February of 74 and reach number 13 early in the spring of 74. Also released in October is Loggins and Messina's Full Sail album, which will go to number 10 on January 5th, 1974. Also in October, just as his album with the Allman Brothers is finishing its run at number one, Greg Allman releases a solo album, Laid Back. This will reach number 13 early in the new year. And also in October came Old Blue Eyes is Back by Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra had retired in 1971, but it didn't really take. Two years later, his return from retirement will earn a lot of publicity for his new album. It'll go to number 13. Former Beatles Paul and George had had huge success with their albums in the spring and summer. Now in the fall, it was John and Ringo's turn. John Lennon's Mind Games album was released on November 2nd. It was a distinct and mostly welcome change from last year's hyper-political, hyper-topical, and not very good Sometime in New York City with Yoko Ono. This was a pure pop album, with a cover somewhat reminiscent of 1971's chart-topping Imagine. It was full of beautiful melodies and nice arrangements. If there was a complaint to be had, it was that, after the in-your-face attitude of his last album, John had gone too far in the other direction. Many of the songs here were uncharacteristically anonymous-sounding. Most of the songs were around the same length, between three and just over four minutes, making the album feel overly homogenous. There were lots of love songs, and when it did get political, the sentiment was so general and vague that it really didn't have much impact. Especially coming from John Lennon, titles like One Day at a Time, Out of the Blue, and I Know, I Know sounded generic and forgettable, and much of the music, though pleasant, was the same. The album certainly has some good tracks and some nice moments, but you got the feeling that Lennon knew he wanted to back off the abrasive politicking, but wasn't exactly sure what direction he did want to go in. 
Released on that same day, November 2nd, was Ringo Starr's first rock album, Ringo. It was almost certainly his best and his most successful. This will go to number two in December. It set the template for Ringo albums to come, featuring many guest stars lending a hand, including all three of his fellow ex-Beatles. The opening track, I'm the Greatest, written by John Lennon, featured John, Ringo, and George, the only track of the 70s since their breakup to feature three former Beatles. The other players on I'm the Greatest, interestingly, were Harry Nilsson, Billy Preston, and Klaus Vormann. Reportedly, when McCartney quit the band, John, George, and Ringo had briefly considered bringing those three into the Beatles to replace him. Paul appears on a couple of other tracks on the album, including one he wrote. George makes a appearances and co-wrote the excellent single Photograph. Among other notables on the album are Mark Bolan and members of the band. Released on November 9th was The Singles, 1969 through 1973 by The Carpenters, a surefire hits package ahead of the holidays. Released on November 10th was Ship Ahoy by The OJs. It'll go to number 11 early in 1974. Released on November 16th was Bette Midler's self-titled album, this will go to number six on January 19th. Released on November 19th was Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's Brain Salad Surgery. This will go to number 11 early in 1974. Also released that day of note to Beach Boys fans was the double set, The Beach Boys in Concert. We will, of course, discuss this in much greater detail in a future episode. Released the next day, November 20th, was the new Alice Cooper album, Muscle of Love. It was another interesting packaging concept, though not quite as cool and coherent as the last couple had been. Actually, the music was not quite as strong as Billion Dollar Babies had been earlier in the year. This will go to number 10 for two weeks, beginning January 12th. And also released in November, was John Denver's Greatest Hits. Never mind that John Denver had had only two top 40 hits at this point. He'd been recording long enough with RCA to cherry pick some of his stronger tracks and issue a Greatest Hits album ahead of the holidays. The package includes Sunshine on My Shoulders from his 1971 Poems, Prayers, and Promises album, which will be re-released as a single and help propel John Denver's greatest hits to number one for three weeks in March and April. Released on December 1st was Jim Croce's posthumous I Got a Name album. This will go to number two early in the new year behind Jim Croce's earlier album You Don't Mess Around with Jim, which will go to number one. Also released on December 1st was Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath by Black Sabbath, which will reach number 11 in the new year. On December 5th came a new album from Paul McCartney and Wings, two Wings anyway, Denny Sewell and Henry McCullough having quit the band shortly before sessions for Band on the Run had begun. Since Wings' Wildlife in 1971, McCartney seems to have been rebuilding, with each successive single and album slightly stronger than the one that came before. Even on a first listen to this, you could tell something was up. From the first notes, Band on the Run exuded a confidence and mastery that we'd only seen in flashes in McCartney's post beatle work to this point. Now, here at the end of 73, McCartney had delivered the kind of excellent album we always knew we could expect from him. Not surprisingly, this will have a long chart run going in and out of the number one spot through the spring and summer of 1974. More about it when we get to that year. Released on December 7th was Tales from Topographic Oceans, the sprawling double album from Yes. And released in the U.S. on December 22nd, was Backman Turner Overdrive 2. This will take a while climbing the charts. It will enter the U.S. Top 40 in March and then become a number four hit in August after the single Taken Care of Business becomes a major hit in the U.S. Also released in December was Love is the Message by MFSB, which will go to number four in the spring of 74, and War Live, another live album in time for the holidays. It'll go to number 13 in the spring. Also released around this time was the soundtrack album for The Sting, with Marvin Hamlish presenting the piano rags of Scott Joplin. This will be huge in 1974. 
And there was an album that had been released on May 25th to little fanfare that was suddenly gaining in prominence. Mike Oldfield's debut album, Tubular Bells, was gaining in popularity since its title track had been used as the opening theme in the season's hit new movie, The Exorcist. This will go to number three early in 1974. And that brings us to the end of music in the fourth quarter of 1973. Some of those records that we kind of glossed over, we will return to in 1974 and talk about in more detail. I hope you enjoyed this. Please hit like and subscribe. And as always, I look forward to your comments. I hope you will join us next time when we wrap up 1973 with a look at movies, television, news, and the Beach Boys in the last three months of the year. Meanwhile, have a great week. Thanks for watching. Bye.